the Fresh Economic Thinking podcast. New ideas and analysis with Dr. Cameron Murray and Jonathan Gadir. Good day, Cameron. How are you going? Ah, oh, good, Jonathan. It's nice to be chatting with you again. Yeah, good to chat with you again. Uh, I'm going to sort of devote this episode to sort of interrogating you a little bit about some of the things that I've heard uh, over the last few episodes and some of your other appearances. Is that all right? Yeah, it sounds great. We should do that. Okay. Well, in your some of your recent uh, episodes that you've posted um, and some of your other appearances, you've sort of found common ground with people who are very critical about media coverage of property cycles. And also you, you've talked about how people are just whinging a bit too much and um, you know, the, mar- <laughs> the property market's just doing what the property market does. And really, if you look at the figures, there's no real crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, people's incomes, uh, you know, have gone up roughly, you know, reflecting the same rises in rental prices. And I, I think yeah. you've basically um, said that the market is just doing what it does and there's no problem. <laughs> That's how I've interpreted some recent uh, uh, appearances and interviews that you've done. And I was yeah. thinking to myself, is this the same guy that advocated passionately in front of the parliament parliamentary committee for government to build public housing? Mm-hmm. And so can you <laughs> unpick that for me? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I can see how you get that impression that on the one hand, I'm saying the market's doing fine. What's everyone complaining about? Uh, and I think the reckon the way I reconcile that is that the market is doing what we should expect markets to do, but it doesn't mean that what the market does in housing is the best of all worlds. Um, so, yes, the market's adjusting quickly, but the problem with housing is that when Incomes rise quickly and rents rise quickly. That doesn't happen evenly, right? So if I say, oh, the the median household income went up 35% nominally in two years, right? That doesn't mean every household's income went up 35%. It, it probably means that some went up 50% or 60%, but there's a huge number of households whose incomes went up 5% or 10% or went down. And the, the issue here with the market outcome is that, yes, we should expect when that happens, rents to rise, but there is a side effect of that, which is that some people drop off the bottom, right? Their income's not rising. Everyone else's is. And so you got you need that safety net to catch them during these adjustment periods. So, for example, I was talking with Michael Machusik. He's a sort of property market guy. And he's saying, what is everyone complaining about? And I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, if I'm looking at a market, analysis, this is what I think should happen. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean we sh- can't improve on that or we can't help people who the market's not working for. So maybe I'll give you an example from our healthcare, right? Yeah. So, you know, pre-public healthcare, we had, uh, we had uh, churches and we had the golden casket lottery, which raised money for the state to fund hospitals. And we had a private insurance market and now people you know i would analyze that market and go oh you know incomes went up uh across the board most of the cost of healthcare is is doctors incomes and nurses incomes therefore we should expect the price of health insurance to rise with income and people might say hey cam thinks everything's fine but i don't i actually think with well, the market you know if i'm predicting how the market will change that's one thing but as a social policy and maximizing welfare, it's kind of a separate thing. So in healthcare, I'd say, yeah, we should definitely have a public health insurance system. You can still let the market do its thing and have private health if you want. But I actually think it's better to have this broader system, even if I'm analyzing the market and saying, you know, this is a normal outcome. Does that make sense? Am I am I clarifying yeah. for you still? Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Um, I guess, uh, and, and maybe this is uh, because you want to find common ground with the people that you're talking to, you you don't really talk about um, the government building public housing side of things when you talk about um, 
you know, the real estate cycle or the um, bad media coverage and um, it, you just sort of leave it at the, well, people are complaining about the market and they're silly to do so. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can see how you see that. And yeah, I think you're right. There's a there's a little bit of finding common ground uh, with sort of market commentators versus like uh-huh. social welfare an- analysts and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I'll take that on board. Um, but yeah, like um, I still think we need okay. the perspective, right? That two thirds of households own their own home, right? So yeah. we're down to one third who are really, you know, potentially struggling. Of the one third, probably half are still doing all right. Their their incomes have risen. They've moved moved to the city, and they're the people who are bidding up rents. Okay, and so we're really down to a sixth, or maybe an eighth. Of the population, okay. And well, so, hang on, hang on. Yeah, Does who, it who matter? Could really benefit from you know uh, more sort of housing welfare or public housing? Okay. So, does it matter that our tax system incentivizes investors to buy property and you know turbocharge the property market? Does that matter? Which which taxes do you have in mind here? Do you mean the like tax the system, meaning the capital gains tax discount for correct, owning assets? Cor- correct. Negative and the, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually an yeah good question. Um, so there are a few ways to consider this effect, right? Um, this is you know a topic of great interest for many people. Uh, Your so buddy can, from the Greens has made it his life's mission. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, is that Max Chandler May that you're talk- yeah. thinking of? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. He's a very passionate guy. I do like Max, but I, I think that on average, the tax story of housing and, and this like we're incentivizing too much investment is is a little bit overplayed. And the reasons are this. You can look to New Zealand. New Zealand ring-fenced negative gearing. So what that means is if you make a loss on your investment property, you can't deduct it deduct it from your other income that tax year. You have to ring fence it and hold it separately and deduct it from future um, future capital gains, right, for that right. property. I'm pretty sure in New Zealand there's no capital gains tax either, and I'm pretty sure they don't have stamp duty, right? So that's kind of a radically different system, right? Mm-hmm. Radically different tax setting. And yet the housing conversation in New Zealand is almost identical. Almost every media article in New Zealand, you can just cut and paste Auckland for Sydney or Wellington for Melbourne or whatever you you want, and it would still make sense here. So those radically different things. And then you can think about the US where they incentivize home ownership even more than us because not only um, is home ownership sort of like tax-free, they actually allow you to deduct mortgage some share of your mortgage interest from your taxable income, right? So that that's a that's a sort of bias, even further than Australia to owner occupation over investment, and yet, you know, on the well, whole, we don't have any we don't have any incentive for owner occupy over investment. It's in, it's always investment over. Uh, well, that sort of depends on your reference point. Like, I, I often I say to you know. We need a sensible reference point to compare to, right? So we could compare to the US and say, yes, we're biased slightly more to investors rather than owner occupiers because Mm -hmm. we don't allow any interest deduction. I think the Dutch also allow mortgage interest deductions for home homeowners. Mm -hmm. So they have more of a bias than us. But think about it this way as well. Um, I'm capital gains tax free for my own home, right? That's a big bias towards owner-occupied housing. Even though if I own an investment property for more than 12 months, I get half, I pay half capital gains tax, I pay zero capital gains tax on my own home. Now you might say, yeah, but you have to pay interest and, and management costs like ownership costs with after-tax dollars for your own home. So when I go and pay my rates and my home insurance and uh, fix up my house, I have to pay with after-tax dollars. But if this was an investment property, that'd be Mm pre-tax so the question is there well what would be an even benchmark and people you know ben phillips who i interviewed a few weeks ago would say well you need to take the income you get as an owner occupier 
the imputed rent, what you're not paying in rent, consider that an income if you wanted an even playing field. Add that to your taxable income, subtract your costs, and pay 50% capital gains tax. And that would be like for like, right? The house I live in, yeah, I, the rental income I'm getting from not having to pay rent, I, I mark that up as an income. The costs that I pay to manage the home and insure it and the interest I subtract. Um, mm-hmm. And if I sell, I pay 50% capital gains. That would be like for like from a sort of purest economic perspective uh, mm-hmm. with the investor incentives. Now, I'm not sure owner occupiers would prefer that to the one we have where it's capital gains tax free, but everything else comes from after tax income, all your costs. What do you think? Like, do you think the bias is towards investing over owner occupying if that's a relevant benchmark? I, it's hard for me to actually know <laughs> mm-hmm. which one is more biased. Well, there are, what I know, I, what I know is that there are countries in the world: Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, uh, whatever yeah, the immigration countries, let's say, mm-hmm. where um, property prices are uh, turbocharged, and then there are other countries where there's not the same thing going on. And I look at the laws in those other countries and I'm not an expert, but I see things like, and I haven't done a systematic study, but I do see things like when you buy, you got to live in the place for at least five years or you or your family or something like that. Yep. Or if, if you buy, it can't, it's not, it's not open to foreigners to, you know, in the same way that it's open to domestic buyers or if you if you um, buy we're gonna an investment property we're gonna tax you at a higher rate than here you mm-hmm. know um, so or a higher rate than um, you yeah you would otherwise uh, be taxed um, well I mean so we, we sort of have that as but well I right? see I see that from other countries would they don't have the same turbocharged property market and you have less intergenerational inequality you have less sense of injustice and like, oh, mm. you know, I'm never going to have the same life that my parents have had because I can't even afford a deposit. All the things that you hear in mm. the the turbocharged property market countries, you don't hear that there because people can buy like they did in the 1960s here. Yeah. Again, I, I think, they, see, I'm going to have to push back um, to that whole, whole markets doing what it's always doing position again. <laughs> Because um, people are buying home ownership in Australia increased slightly from 2016 to 2021 in the census. And I would predict it's going to increase again when we do the 2026 census. When you say so, increase, like what? Like, so what it was do like, do you mean like 65, the percentage of? Yeah, yeah. Percentage of households who that are owner occupied. So it was 65.4 in 2016 and 66.0. But is, does, that, does that just mean like heaps of older people are paying off their mortgages and becoming owners? Um, no. So, for example, the ownership rate of, um, I think, 35 to 45-year-olds caught up in from 2016 to 2021 to the previous sort of gen- t- 10 years prior, the 2011 cohort. So, there was a bit of catching up. The actual big, in Australia, the big sort of low point for home ownership and first home buying was actually the mid-2010s from sort of 2012, after we had a couple of first home buyer boosts after the financial crisis, from sort of 2012 to 2017 was a real low point. But because prices were relatively stable uh, in most parts of the country, not so much in Sydney, but the rest of the country, very stable. Um, okay, does it, it matter that so this home ownership... Okay, does it matter that this home ownership is based on very large mortgages? Oh, well, yeah, this is the, well, it's a good question because if I was one of those first home buyers who jumped in the market from 2017 to 2020, right, I had a great time with my mortgage because interest rates fell for a few years. I probably locked in a 2% interest rate for three years. And so I've built up sort of three years of savings into my mortgage prior to now where interest rates have gone up and it's, it is very difficult. Um, but let me just also say, you mentioned that you know some countries, they tax investor buying more than others. Well, in Australia, we actually do that with stamp duty. So most states have a stamp duty discount for first home buyers compared to investors. 
And so, for example, in New South Wales, it might be like twenty thousand dollars. Uh, the advantage you get just from stamp duty from being an owner occupier rather than an investor. So, and, and I think in Queensland, it's it's even more. And I think, you know, we've had first homeowners grants for a long time. I think there's thirty thousand dollars up for grabs at the moment in some places. So, yeah, we kind of have a we have a weird system. I'll give you that. <laughs> Whereas a lot of ad hoc, oh, here's a stamp duty discount. Uh, here's a cash grant. Um, here's this. Uh, but the other guys, were, you know, on the other hand, for their investors, we're now doing, oh, we're going to reduce taxes on build to rent landlords, right? <laughs> That's another yeah. sort of hodgepodgey type change where we're like, oh, we want to incentivize first home ownership. So we're going to do these deals. But at the same time, we don't want investors to leave. So we better give them an equal and opposite um, tax advantage. And then the problem, of course, is one buyer is competing with the other, right? So if you if you... If you're always going, oh, we want to advantage first home ownership, but we don't want investors to leave, you're going to end up sort of never tilting the balance too much in one direction or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the home ownership rate in Australia is, is you know, it's not too bad. It did have periods of decline, but what you find in Australia and the United States, for example, the United States is back up to record high home ownership. Right, and it was pre- the previous record high was prior to the financial crisis. You find it's quite pro-cyclical, mm-hmm. right? Because you want to you want to buy a rising asset. If you're a first home buyer and prices are falling, you don't really want to leverage into that. So mm-hmm. people tend to shift their purchasing decisions through time and buy in the upswing. Now you might say, and some people do. Oh well, you've you've sucked in all these first home buyers during the boom who are highly leveraged, just in time for the bust. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that does actually happen to a degree each cycle. Uh, that's why f- f- that's why home ownership declined in the United States after the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, again, this is my sort of point: is well, yeah, that's a a sort of side effect of market processes and that's why we should have more than just these market options for housing for people so to get back to your first question yeah you know your 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 government housing uh, proposal your your the people interviewing you on investment podcasts wouldn't like that would they yeah, it's a mixed bag, to be honest. So some builders are totally okay with it because they're like, yeah, I love big, <laughs> good condition contracts with uh, state governments, right? Because uh, I get all the sweet sweeteners in the contract. So a lot of construction companies are okay with it. But uh, property owners and developers who are essentially, so there's a lot of major subdivisions in fringe suburbs, which are almost um, targeting first home buyers, right? They don't want to compete with some kind of subsidized system that's going to you know, sort of take their market. So they they hate it, right? In fact, um, this is a long-term political tension between market and social provision of housing is that, well, you've got a subsidized state actor essentially competing for the customers of the private market and next and time thinking, you're next yeah. time you're on one of these investor type podcasts or talking to one of these guys i want yeah. to hear a debate between you on this topic oh yeah <laughs> great well that's that's a really good idea mate i'm gonna um I'm otherwise gonna... it's all too friendly you know oh um, yeah it is a bit friendly but yeah i mean this is let me just quote from my book okay. um president truman 1949 was trying to get up public housing in the United States with the Housing Act of 1949. And he was the lobby, the, the, the landlord lobby, right, was so against it. They, he said in a speech, I've been shocked in recent days at the extraordinary propaganda campaign that has been unleashed against this bill, the Housing Act of 1949, by the real estate lobby. I do not recall ever having witnessed a more deliberate campaign of misrepresentation and distortion against legislation of such crucial importance to the public welfare. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So this is uh, <laughs> this is the sort of tension, I guess, and this is why change is so hard in housing. Um, so that we end up with this hodgepodge of tax tweaks, a few thousand here, a few thousand there, stamp duty discount temporarily, 
But then we end up in this weird cycle of, oh, well, if we've given first home buyers a tax advantage, we better do the same for investors. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird political equilibrium, I guess you could call it, the way, the way we've been sucked in. So you, you, you know, point to some of the um, ways that the that people complain or that the, you know, the media and maybe even your friend Max chandler um talk about things that are, you know, at odds with the data. Okay. Mm. I would like some equal and opposite attention to, or some, some equivalent attention to um, property investors, landlords, let's say, who construct yeah. elaborate ideological justifications, <laughs> which are just complete nonsense in my, in my, um, my way of looking at things. For example, I hear, yep. including from people in my, friendship circles oh but you know if i didn't have three investment properties and people like me weren't doing what we're doing um there'd be no um uh properties for people to rent uh people need places to rent and we're providing that so yeah. come on cameron give me give me the, <laughs> the answer as to why that's complete bullshit yeah, well, because uh, the who owns the stock of homes doesn't really change how many houses there are available to live in, right? And so when investors sell, they either sell to another investor or an own first home buyer, right? Or if they sell to a second home buyer, that person's freeing up their previous home, right? So the net well, would it be fair to say if the tax system didn't incentivize them to have three investment properties, they wouldn't have three investment properties. The price might be lower and people who are renting from them might be buying the place. That, yeah, I think that's right. I think, yeah, the, the sec so the second element to that is, yes, you can change the composition by essentially subsidizing one form of ownership over another. The question is, in that process, um, what flow-on effect does that have to the rate at which we add to the stock of homes as well? So the investors will say, well, because we buy off the planned housing and first home buyers don't really do that, we are the only, we're the sort of the, the, the doorway to adding to the stock. And if you close that door, yes, we can sort of switch ownership of the existing stock, but you're going to have a slower growth. Now, I'm not really sure that that's true. We might have a different composition of new homes because first home buyers like houses more than apartments. So we might have a different composition. But that's that's sort of the, the steel man, the, the best argument that investors have. But what you find really interesting in Victoria right now, they're, they're sort of doing what you suggest is, is taxing investment more to bias home ownership by boosting land taxes on non-homeowners uh, across the state. And what you're finding and this is partly why I predicted the 2026 census will show a, another bump in home ownership, is you're finding a real reshuffling of ownership in Victoria of undeveloped housing and investment housing because the you know those investor owners are now being taxed more, they're being punished financially. And so the, 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 those previous patient owners who wanted to just sit on these properties because they want the cash flow or they've got undeveloped lots that they are hanging on for the future, those owners don't want that asset anymore. So they're selling to people who do, and that includes a lot of first-time buyers. So <clears throat> yeah, I guess you're right. You can sort of shift the balance with taxes. How that flows out long-term, I'm not really sure because you know the adjustment process to a new tax regime happens once. And then after that, what? What continues to happen, I'm not sure. So it's going to be a really interesting experiment. I'm actually looking forward to the data in Victoria from the next census to compare it to Brisbane, you know, Sydney, um, other states, uh, to see how much of an effect that had. Well, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Mm. Um, all right. Well, I think that answers a lot of what I had uh, questions about. Um, I guess my my one piece of constructive criticism would be just like your book is very forthright in just having an honest debate about things that are you know obfuscated and you know hidden behind um, you know sort of ideological um, obfuscation. Um, I would say when you when you have these debates with people face to face, don't be so polite. Talk yeah. about your um, talk about your desire for public 
housing and let's have uh, let's have them respond and you know let's have that out in the open well, i think that's totally fair mate yeah I, I i do need to live up to the standards i expect uh, i'm glad you're paying attention to these interviews thanks for that <laughs> and um yeah hopefully we can be a lot more straightforward yeah from here on in i mean that's what our, our fresh economic thinking is meant to be about really keep it together but yeah it's, it's easy yeah. to get sucked into keeping everyone happy and having friendly interviews. Oh, that's, that's, that's all right. <laughs> all right. See you next time. Thanks, mate. See you then. Bye.